the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from The Magic Monastery by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. Thirsty There was once a king who was thirsty. He did not quite know what the difficulty was, but he said, My throat is dry. Lackeys at once ran swiftly to find something suitable to alleviate the condition. They came back with lubricating oil. When the king drank it, his throat did not feel dry any more, but he knew that something was not right. The oil produced a curious sensation in his mouth. He croaked, My tongue feels awful. There is a curious taste. It is slippery. His doctor immediately prescribed pickles and vinegar, which the king ate. Soon he had stomach ache and watering eyes to add to his sorrows. I think I must be thirsty, he mumbled, for his sufferings had made him do some thinking. Thirst never made the eyes water, said the courtiers to one another. But kings are often capricious, and they ran to fetch rose water and scented syrupy wines fit for a king. The king drank it all, but still he felt no better, and his digestion was ruined. A wise man who happened along in the middle of this crisis said, His majesty needs ordinary water. A king could never drink common water, shouted the court in unison. Of course not, said the king, and in fact I feel quite insulted, both as a king being offered plain water and also as a patient. After all, it must be impossible that such a dreadful and daily more complicated ailment as mine could have a simple remedy. Such a concept is contrary to logic, a disgrace to its originator and an affront to the sick. That is how the wise man came to be renamed the Idiot. The Realm One of the Sufi masters said to his companion, I have need of money to save the king who must pay his troops. But, said the companion, why does the king not get the money himself? People must not know that the populace does not pay the taxes, otherwise a worse monarch might overcome the king. They set off on a journey to seek the money. At the first house at which they called, the householder said, Take everything I have, for I know you to be wise and good. But the sage refused to take the money. His companion asked him why, and the master answered, Should I, to save a king, spoil a subject, who would, after paying, do anything he liked, believing that he has bought forgiveness? Then why did we call it that house? To see whether this man's inner life had progressed, whether he was yet a person who can give without buying. At the second house, the master took one half of the money which was offered to him. Again, his companion asked him why he did not take it all, or refuse the money altogether. Because he will be impressed that we did not take all the money, and will listen to the next dervish who comes this way, who happens to be a true one. And if we had refused all the money, he would have been even more impressed, Not this particular man, for he would have wondered why we were not attending to our mission to find funds for the king. What would you have done if you had known that the next dervish to call here were to be a false one? I would have turned this man against us to shield him against trusting dervishes for a time. After several weeks of this journey, they had collected the necessary amount of money. Now the companion said, I have been wondering why it is that you, a holy dervish, did not use occult powers to obtain money which was so urgently needed. The master said, One of the reasons was that you needed the lessons of this journey. 
But, said the companion, if I am still asking you shallow questions, how can I have benefited by the experiences? This was the question which it was necessary for you to ask, said the dervish, so that you might have the answer. On this imperfect earth, once you set foot here, you are bound to use imperfect methods, the methods of the earth. To use special powers, one has to be engaged in something of greater significance than obtaining the pay of an army, even though, as in this case, it is for the preservation of the stability of a realm. Vanity A Sufi sage once asked his disciples to tell them what their vanities had been before they began to study with him. The first said, I imagined that I was the most handsome man in the world. The second said, I believed that, since I was religious, I was one of the elect. The third said, I believed I could teach. And the fourth said, My vanity was greater than all these, for I believed that I could learn. The sage remarked, And the fourth disciple's vanity remains the greatest for his vanity is to show that he once had the greatest vanity. Destitution A monkey once said to a man, Do you not realize how destitute I am? I have no house, no clothes, no fine food like you, no savings, furniture, lands, articles of adornment, nothing at all. You, in contrast, have all these things and more. Besides, you are a rich man. The man felt ashamed. He made over everything he had to the monkey, beggaring himself. When the monkey had taken legal charge of his entire possessions, the man said to him, Now what are you going to do with all this? The monkey said, Why should I talk to a penniless fool like you? Where it starts. A certain Sufi master was walking along a country road with one of his disciples. The disciple said, I know that the best day of my life was when I decided to seek you out, and when I discovered that through your presence I would find myself. The Sufi said, Decision, whether for support or opposition, is a thing which you do not know until you know it. You do not know it through thinking that you know it. The disciple said, Your meaning is obscure to me, and your statement is dark, and your intention is veiled from me. The master said, You will in a few moments see something about the value of decision, and who it is that makes decisions. Presently they came to a meadow where a farm worker was throwing a stick to a dog. The Sufi said, I will count five, and he will throw three sticks to the dog. Sure enough, when the Sufi had so counted, the man picked up three sticks and threw them to the dog, even though they were out of earshot and the man had not seen the pair. Now the Sufi said, I will count three, and the man will sit down. As soon as he had counted to three, the man did indeed sit down suddenly on the ground. Now the disciple, full of wonder, said, Could he be induced to raise his arms into the air? The Sufi nodded, and as they watched, the man's hands rose towards the sky. The disciple was amazed, but the Sufi said, Let us now approach this man and speak with him. When they had saluted the farm worker, the Sufi said to him, Why did you throw three sticks instead of one for the dog to retrieve? The farm man answered, I decided to do it as a test, to see whether he could follow more than one stick. So it was your decision? Yes, said the man. Nobody told me to do it. And, said the Sufi, why did you sit down so suddenly? because I thought I would rest. Did anyone suggest it? There is nobody here to suggest it. 
And when you raised your arms in the air, why was that? Because I decided that it was lazy to sit on the ground, and I felt that raising my arms towards the heavens would indicate that I should work rather than rest, and that inspiration to overcome laziness came from on high. Was that a decision of your own and nobody else's? And there was, indeed, nobody to make such a decision for me, and in any case it followed from my previous action. The Sufi now turned to the disciple and said, Immediately before this experience, you were saying to me that you were glad you had made certain decisions, such as the one that you should seek me out. The disciple was completely silent, but the farm worker said, I know you dervishes. You're trying to impress this hapless youth with your powers, but it is sure to be a form of trickery. Statistic A poor man said to a rich one, All my money goes on food. Now that's your trouble, said the rich man. I only spend 5% of my money on food. Night and Morning Khwaja Talizan was a Sufi teacher who communicated his spirituality to dervishes at his center entirely by thought contact, which is sometimes called the heart-to-heart -heart action. In the studies, no word was spoken and no movement made. One day, a party of intending disciples arrived at the court, eager to take part in the ceremonies, the observances, and the exercises which they expected would be the basis of the activities at this place, which was called the Taslim Khana, the House of Resignation. After they had been seen by one of the Khwaja's deputies and had had converse with him, they were shown into the Hall of Knowledge, where elaborate ceremonial, complicated exercises, and unusual music occupied their attention for many hours. The following day all were called before the master. He asked them whether they felt uplifted by their experiences of the night before. Seated in the centre of the hall, the visitors one by one declared that this had been one of the most sublime experiences of their lives. The resident dervishes stood against the walls, silently observing. Other guests were also present. When the visitors had completed their reports and concluded with pleas for acceptance as dervishes, the Khawaja spoke. He first thanked his guests for their praise and for their wishes for his health and the continued prosperity of the house. Then he said, This morning there are three kinds of people among us. First are the minute discerners, the dervishes who know what has happened and need no information about it. Second are the new arrivals, who may learn, from proximity, what has happened. Third are our guests of last night. It is you people whom I address in the tongue of man, for you will not hear the speech of angels. You people have tasted of hospitality, ceremonial, and boon companionship. You have not tasted of spirituality here, whatever you may believe about this matter. We provided the entertainments and the hospitality so that those of you who wish for entertainment might not be disappointed, as should be the actions of good hosts. We also provided, as is the work of those who know, the direct communication. This was, and always remains, accessible. But it is and was accessible in this manner following. Not to those engaged in tasting the world in the name of pious observances. Their inner taste is useless. Not to those who might merely spurn the observances and imagine that the spurning itself makes them anything better. The derision destroys the inner capacity of taste. Only to those who really taste the wine without chewing the glass. It is those among you who really speak the language of the wine and not of the glass. We have had a period of noise in which the lips and tongue, the outward voice, have spoken to me of their outward experiences, the pleasure in exercises and ceremonials, and even of the pain of their searching. 
now we shall have a space of silence, in which the inward voice of those in whom one is alive shall speak to our inwardness about the experiences which we have extended other than the music, food, repetitions, and exercises. Those who ask with the inward voice shall be heard by the inward ear. Speak now in that language. Man and Animal The mouse said, I want to find crumbs. The dog said, I have come to find crusts. The simpleton said, What you need is bread, you fools. The wise man said, But you could let them have other kinds of food. The simpleton was annoyed. He said, the common denominator of their desires is bread, not food. You're becoming too complicated. Obvious Simab, in his youth, said to a dervish whom he met sitting at the wayside, Would that I could do any solitary thing that would cause men to count me among the saints. The dervish raised his head from his knee and instantly replied, That is the easiest thing in the world to do. Simab begged the dervish to tell him the secret. The dervish said, Thousands of Sufis have been murdered by good people for saying things which those people did not like. All you have to do is utter an incomprehensible remark. Then you will be doing at least one thing which couples your name with that of the greatest saint, Halaj. Who would want more than that? If external behavior and the beliefs of men made saints, there would be no earth, only a heaven full of obvious saints. Prisoner A man was once sent to prison for life for something which he had not done. When he had behaved in an exemplary way for some months, his jailers began to regard him as a model prisoner. He was allowed to make his cell a little more comfortable, and his wife sent him a prayer carpet which she had herself woven. When several more months had passed, this man said to his guards, I am a metal worker, and you are badly paid. If you can get me a few tools and some pieces of tin, I will make small decorative objects which you can take to the market and sell. We could split the proceeds to the advantage of both parties. The guards agreed, and presently the smith was producing finely wrought objects whose sale added to everyone's well-being. Then, one day, when the jailers went to the cell, the man had gone. They concluded that he must have been a magician. After many years, when the error of the sentence had been discovered and the man was pardoned and out of hiding, the king of that country called him and asked him how he had escaped. The tinsmith said, Real escape is possible only with the correct concurrence of factors. My wife found the locksmith who had made the lock on the door of my cell and other locks throughout the prison. She embroidered the interior designs of the locks in the rug which she sent me, on the spot where the head is prostrated in prayer. She relied upon me to register this design, and to realize that it was the wards of the locks. It was necessary for me to get materials with which to make the keys, and to be able to hammer and work metal in my cell. I had to enlist the greed and need of the guards, so that there would be no suspicion. That is the story of my escape. Characteristics One of the great Sufis was asked, Whence comes this teaching? Whose thoughts are you giving us? What is the name of your teacher? He answered, If I say it is from inspiration, I shall be a heretic. If I say it is my own, some will worship me and not heed it. Others will criticize it and not heed me. If I name my teacher, all will turn to him and ignore real study. Someone said, Yet, and I seek pardon for saying this, you have named the great among the ancients as sources of the teaching, 
Are we not in danger of turning to them and not to what they have taught because of this? He replied, If, after being told a hundred times that all the teachers are one and that all names refer to characteristics, you still turn to personality, then you are in such danger. The man asked, Then what shall I do? The Sufi told him, Stop imagining that because you can ask a question, you can perceive the answer without any of the qualities necessary for such perception to operate. Theoretician once upon a time there was a man of great repute for his wisdom who lived in a certain town. He told the people about life and death, about the planets and the earth, about history and every kind of unknown thing. One day a dam burst and the people went running to him to tell them how they could solve the problem. The wise man drew himself up to his full height. I think that you should avoid asking such puerile questions from a man of the mind. I am not a water engineer. I am a theoretician. This podcast is copyright 2016, the Idrishah Foundation.